Coming up. Super mum, super wife, supermodel. Let's talk about the bombshell that you've dropped. Elle McPherson's controversial choice. I'm not here to be popular. The supermodel defends... It's such a wake-up call for me. ...her unconventional okay. cancer treatment. It's extremely important. And I trust you on this. Elle McPherson has made a hugely successful career out of being able to draw attention to herself. In the 1980s and 90s, the body, as she was known, was arguably the most photographed Australian in the world. But now the supermodel is making headlines for the controversial way she tackled a very personal and serious setback in her life. Seven years ago, Elle was diagnosed with breast cancer, but chose to reject conventional treatment. As she tells Nine's Tracy Grimshaw, it was a difficult decision, but the right one for her. I'm calling it off, calling it off. Elle, welcome home. So wonderful to be here. We had to bring you to a beach. Do you know, it's such a beautiful day today. I was looking at these surfers and thinking it's been a really long time since I've been surfing. It's hard to work out the more iconic image in this setting. So beautiful. How can you not want to be in here? Sydney's famous Bondi Beach or the supermodel beside me? It's a picture-perfect scene, but I'm not meeting the Elle McPherson everyone might be expecting. I'm not a big sort of like get in my bikini and come down to Bondi and parade around kind of girl. Um, <laughs> I probably was when I was younger, but I, I, uh, I'm certainly not now. Do you actually have that body consciousness in a bikini? Because you look great in a bikini, Elle. You've spent your whole life in it, it seems. Thanks for that. Well, you, know, sure. do you, you don't need me to tell you that, Elle. I mean, you, you do. Elle doesn't need anyone to tell her anything. She's more than 40 years into a very successful and very public career. It's one that's always been beautifully curated and controlled. OK, how's this light for me? Too red, too dark, too oh, look. Give me loads of backlight. <laughs> cut, cut, cut. But now she's dropping her guard. She's written about her life's challenges, revealing at 60 an openness and vulnerability we've never seen or heard before. You've talked about uh, mental health issues, physical health issues, uh, marriage breakdowns, addiction. Why do that? What I'm sharing really is to how to navigate through them and uh, the lessons that I learned through them. But you've always been a bit mysterious. That's been my notion of you. <laughs> I, I mean, I've always had a sense watching your career from afar of what you're doing, but I've never really had much of a sense of who you are. Mm. And I now have that sense from having read your book, which I think is a big leap for you to take perhaps. You know, I learned early on in my career the importance of discretion in your personal life. But this book is very different in the sense that it is with great purpose that I share those things. It's not just to share them for the sake of it. They come with a purpose. Elle McPherson has always attracted attention. It's why she's been so good at her job. Back in the early 80s, it all began with this soft drink ad. A simple stroll on the sand that turned Elle into Australia's most famous bikini body. I think every girl in Australia wanted to look like you on the beach. I, I... want to look like that on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> you did look like that on the I beach. I did. That was you, Elle McPherson. And I think every bloke wanted their girl to look like you on the beach. But how did you think you looked? Feeling very self-conscious as I had the camera up my bum and the sand was hot and sort of more conscious of doing the job rather than what I looked like in a bathing suit. You also didn't have a great amount of self-confidence. You didn't really believe you were beautiful. You used to try and hide your face. and Still do. That's a surprise to me and I think it would be a surprise to people. Mm. Why do you think that was? I, you know, I, I've tried to go through you know, and, and figure out what it is that made me feel so not cut out for modelling because ultimately I had everything that you need for modelling. I had that body and still have close to that body and part of me was being very young 
and doing a job that I had no experience in, and so therefore I wasn't going to be good, and so therefore I didn't belong. It's hard to believe Elle ever felt like an imposter. That stupid, goofy, nervous thing. I can see it, like, all over the my The truth face. is, she was born to be a model, a Do showstopper, off and on the catwalk, even if she didn't feel it. You had this big smile on your face. Mm. You looked like you were enjoying it. When I look at that, I look, oh, man, I look so confident, so cool and so relaxed and so composed. And I know the way I felt walking down the runway, which was anything but that. Nerves on the inside, but the opposite on the outside, as Elle went global. She became a supermodel. Then in the late 80s, Time magazine dubbed her the body, and that title became a brand. Massive deals followed, including lingerie and skincare contracts. For a time, she even co-owned a fashion cafe. Hey, it was no surprise when the TV and movie makers came knocking. Your eyes close while he licks your belly button. Oh, sirens. <laughs> Boobs. <laughs> I'm surprised you can show that on TV. I remember when I read the script, I was like, man, these 1930s models are not kind of lean and athletic. I, I need to change my body type because if I go with this body, it's not going to be believable. I, mean, I, I remember putting on 20 pounds for that role. The camera loved Elle so much, every project she signed up to seemed to succeed. But as so often happens, fame and a big life came at a cost, and it wasn't pretty. Alcohol got its hooks into her. The pressure of the pressure I put on myself to um, deliver in all aspects of my life to the best of my ability was um, uh, was unsustainable. That's the bottom line. And then at one point, it was just like. No can do anymore. Alcohol addiction is sneaky and people usually take a long time before they realise yeah. they're addicted. How did that build up with you? You know, I, I probably had inklings inside myself that was like, oh, you know, that seven o'clock vodka every night is probably not that healthy. But because I was so capable in all areas of my life, the concept of being an alcoholic, for example. Um, you know, my idea was somebody who was completely incapacitated in their life. They lived in a skip under the, you know, railroad. They were, they, they were down and outers. And what I came to understand is that, you know, you don't have to hit rock bottom in order to be um, using alcohol as a crutch in your life. Here's to being a great cook. When pregnant. 60 Minutes <laughs> caught up with Elle in 1997, she was pregnant with her first son, Flynn. And this is my every now and then glass of wine. It's, it's for show. Of course, it was a different time, but you wouldn't see this today. Was that when you had started to drink too much, Elle? No, no, it wasn't. But, you know, in Europe, women drank wine all the way through their pregnancy. And so that's what I knew, that I didn't even think about it. Right. I wouldn't choose to do that today. It was after the pregnancies that I just, you know, things went pear-shaped. What did alcoholism look like to you? How much were you drinking and, and... It's never really about how much you drink, it's why. And so the point was for me was that I, I felt that I couldn't live life on life's terms without some crutch. And alcohol was the easiest one. You probably also were living in a, you know, a fast party culture too, because it wasn't just alcohol, it was party drugs as well, wasn't it? That... In the 80s and 90s, I mean, everybody was, you know, there was so much recreational drugs around, for sure. And, um, <clears throat> and nobody thought twice of it. And, you know, they were said, uh, you know, for example, cocaine is not addictive and, and you know, it was, it was a sort of footloose and fancy free time. Would you say now that it, it was addictive, that you were addicted to, say, cocaine? You, I mean, you didn't know that at the time. No, I, I wasn't addicted to cocaine. But the grog was certainly Ow. taking its toll. It was the early 2000s. Elle was engaged to hedge fund billionaire Archie Busson, 
and raising their two young sons, Flynn and Sai. She says her drinking had escalated to the point where she was sick and unhappy. Elle knew she was struggling and checked herself in for treatment in Arizona. When we're out of balance in that way within ourselves, it's um, a really painful place to be. I just wanted to get well. There is shame around it though, isn't there? And, and I guess there is a stigma around it, particularly when you've pressured yourself to be perfect your whole life. Well, I think there's more of a stigma around, you know, being drunk. How was rehab for you? You've never talked about it before. Yeah, so. I, had a, I had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Really? You know, yeah, six weeks away, um, time away from my life that was, at that time, was overwhelming. You know, remember, I'd worked since I was 18 years old, day in, day out, mm. pretty much, in a very high-profile kind of um, life, and it changed my life forever. When you came home, did you try to pick up where you'd left off, being super mum, super wife, super model? I think I, I put on the brakes a little more when I got home. Uh, you know, I realised it didn't have to be everything to everybody. Elle had to make hard decisions about her future, and the toughest was walking away from her 10-year relationship with Aki. And you said, Aki didn't want to be under control of my lifestyle, and I didn't want to be a victim of his. Mm. Well, I think it's that idea of trying to control another human being, another being, you know, that is definitely not love. Love and control can't coexist. And I think if your lifestyles are not aligned, that's when it becomes tricky. It's not because one drinks and one doesn't or one, you know, works more and one doesn't. It's where there's no alignment in your lifestyle and that can become very um, dissonant. I'm thinking that must have been a very tough decision, though, for you, given that you'd come from a broken marriage and now mm. you had two little kids and you were walking away from a relationship... Yes. ..that had been, what, 10 years? Yeah. I walked away from the dream, you know, growing old with the father of my children, and I walked towards a new relationship with Aki. It's still with so much love for the boys. We co-parented. We just didn't live together. How do you manage it now? How does oh, that I sit haven't with had you? a drink. I haven't had a drink for 21. No, I hear you. Yeah, but so I mean if... what, what do I do? I go to AA meetings um, often. Uh, um, and for many, many years, I would go to an AA meeting every, every day, sometimes two, sometimes three times a day. Do you ever have days now where you feel like you want to drink? Never. Never. Beating the booze was a mark of Elle's strength but there was an even bigger test looming. Coming up, Elle McPherson's toughest challenge. Let's talk about the bombshell that you've dropped in this book. Um, yes, so um, what do you want to know? The star is born. Back in the 1980s and 90s, they weren't called supermodels for nothing. Elle McPherson easily took her place in this elite group. But even in the glare of attention, she retained a certain mystery. Today, tucked away in a tiny corner of Bondi... Thank you so much. You Congratulations. Welcome. Author Elle is a much more open book. Thank you, Elle. What's your name? Oh, my name's Gemma. Gemma? Do you feel like the baby bird is flying the nest, sitting here today signing your book in a bookstore? <laughs> uh, that's a really interesting analogy. I feel like it's more like the woman has come to land. The eagle has landed. Because <laughs> until now, it's been a labour of love. It's It's been in your head and now it's out in the world. Just to see it in, in the tangible reality is, is pretty extraordinary. And um... As she looks back on her life, she wants to share the lessons she had to learn the hard way. On issues like mental health, addiction, marriage breakdowns, and most recently, a cancer diagnosis. Many years ago, you threw your support behind breast cancer research. Yes. You said that it was because you'd made a living out of your breasts. True. And that proved to be prophetic, didn't it, Elle? Mm. Um, yes, so... Um... What do you want to know? 
I want to know about that phone call that you had in 2017, <laughs> which is every woman's yeah. worst nightmare that you're now telling us about. I was diagnosed with breast cancer, let's put it simply. And um, as you can imagine, it was a bit of a shock. Did you think, hang on, I, you know, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I keep myself fit, yeah. I eat really well, yes. I'm a wellness guru. How the hell is this happening to me? Absolutely. And I think any woman, most women, would say that when they're diagnosed. Nobody thinks it's going to happen to them. Elle says there was no time to give in to fear. She immediately underwent lumpectomy well, surgery. At the time, I thought it was quite um, a big step, but it was nothing compared to, you know, what was later suggested. And so I had a lumpectomy to see what kind of cancer it was and what kind of tumour it was. And then, uh, you know, then I got the results from that and then I had a second lumpectomy. And I was told I had a, a reasonably aggressive uh, type of breast cancer. All right, so you had the second lumpectomy and I think they removed half your breast tissue, is that mm. right? And no clear margins? No clear margins on the second uh, either. This is important. When a patient is told no clear margins, it means there's a risk cancer cells may still be present. Elle's specific type of cancer is called HER2-positive, estrogen-receptive, intraductal carcinoma. It's generally considered precancerous and non-invasive, but it still has to be completely removed. Remember, Elle had no clear margins. Intraductal cancer is not generally considered a candidate for chemotherapy, but the follow-up treatment she was recommended was aggressive. What were you told needed to happen? Mastectomy, chemotherapy, radiation and hormone replacement. Yeah, it was, it was one of those moments, <laughs> you know. I sit here cool as a cucumber talking about it, but the reality is, you know, it was a very big um, deep breath moment, let's put it that way. So you're told mastectomy. Mm -hmm. Were you going to do that? I thought about it, yeah. Something didn't feel right about it, though. Why not? You know, it's not, it's not logical. It was just an inner sense. It, I had a, 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 a feeling that there was a different way to approach this. And, and I followed it. it. Is it, did you resist it because you understandably didn't want to lose one or both breasts? I mean, understandably, ill. I think, you know, if I have a choice of losing my life or losing my breasts, I think I would choose to lose the breasts. So, and that was the, that was the alternative that I was given. So it was not a vanity choice, let me put it that way. Um, it was, uh, it was a, I made a choice to go a more natural route in my um, treatment because that's what really resonated with me from within, from my, my, the last 20 years of my life. Um, I had been following natural medicine. I had been really looking at the body as a, in a holistic way. So looking at emotional, mental, emo uh, spiritual and physical well-being. Put simply, um, after the lumpectomies, Elle rejected cancer. traditional cancer treatment. So you are told that you should have radiotherapy, chemotherapy, mm -hmm. a mastectomy, uh, hormone blockers because yours was an oestrogen receptive yeah. carcinoma. You decide not to do any of that. I decided to do different things. What did you do? We don't have enough time to talk about that because it was such an intense protocol. But the overriding um, protocol was a natural protocol, but very complex. What Elle does explain in her book is that she consulted 32 practitioners before deciding on eight months of intense therapy under the guidance of two holistic doctors in Phoenix, Arizona. Her treatment included natural medications through intravenous drips, dentistry, osteopaths, chiropractors, and a lot of spiritual work. 
Do you believe that you cured your breast cancer holistically? Well, the word cure is a very interesting word. No, I healed through breast cancer. Yes, I did. And, and it wasn't just me. I had a very formidable team that helped me through it. So now I would, you know, I'm clinically um, in remission. That's words that, you know, most doctors would say. Now, this is where our interview gets a little uncomfortable for both of us. Normally, a person's cancer treatment plan would be nobody else's business. But Elle chose to write about her very unconventional choices. We consulted an Australian breast oncologist who told us how Elle's cancer would have been treated here and expressed very real concerns about the protocol that she followed. Because one in seven Australian women will be diagnosed with breast cancer, it would be irresponsible for us not to share that with you. The specialist told us that because of her choices, Elle now has statistically a 20% chance of recurrence in 10 years. She's already at seven years. I want to be absolutely responsible in this in this moment because people are looking at you and they're looking at me as to, you know, when they're making their own decisions. That's 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 a responsibility that I feel, and I wouldn't normally talk to. I've never done this before. I've never mm. talked to anyone in such detail about something as personal as breast cancer. Mm. But I think we need to go into more detail around yours now because of the path you took and because I'm so mindful of decisions people might make. So if you'd sought treatment in Australia, you would not have been offered chemotherapy. Yes. Um, you would have only been offered a mastectomy if there were no clear margins. Mm. Which there were none. And you probably wouldn't have been offered radiotherapy if mm. you were offered a mastectomy, but you would have been urged to have radiotherapy without a mastectomy. Yeah. You would have also been urged to have hormone blockers because of the estrogen receptive yeah. element of it. Does all of that fit with some of the advice that you were given? I think, Australia, well, I noticed because I spoke to uh, Australian doctors here, we do have a different way of, of um, well, it seems to be that there's a different way of, uh, uh, treating breast cancer here in Australia than there are than there is, for example, in America and some hospitals in America. There's more for us still to thrash out here, but for Elle, it's her body, her choice, and she chose the path less travelled. Your decision was quite unconventional, mm -hmm. <laughs> like the rest of my life. <laughs> like a, like a lot why of your you, life. Why would you be surprised? What do you understand about your risk of recurrence going forward? Elle McPherson's in her element, working the camera from all angles. Today, she's the founder and face of a booming wellness company and author. In her new book, she's sharing the lessons of a big life with big challenges including her 2017 breast cancer diagnosis and the decision she made to reject chemotherapy, radiation and a mastectomy. I'm curious to know what underpinned this decision. Yes. Are you not generally a fan of conventional Western medicine? Uh, it depends, you know. It can be great if you have a car accident and you need a limb cut off. It can be great. I mean, there's incredible... There's, it's individual, you know, I don't, uh, painting a broad brushstroke over, you know, conventional medicine would be um, disingenuous from my perspective. And there's time and place for everything. However, I have adopted um, a more natural lifestyle because that's what works for me. So do you not take antibiotics if you have an infection? Do you not have a flu jab each year because you have a history of pneumonia? Have you chosen not to do that, for example? Uh, I've chosen to look after my body in the most natural way possible for the bulk of the time. So if I keep myself well, for example, and I don't get the flu, um, in fact, I can't even remember the last time I had the flu, and if I can, Get by without antibiotics? I usually do. Seven years ago, plenty of doctors told Elle she needed aggressive medical intervention to treat her breast cancer. But after two lumpectomies, 
and complex natural therapy, she says she's now clinically in remission. Did you talk to any of those doctors who had said to you back then that you should have a mastectomy and, a, yes. and chemotherapy and radio? And what do they think about your results now? Have you gone back to them and said, have a, have a look? Like, na, 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 na. No, I listen, I, I got a lot of advice. I spoke to 32 doctors along the way and I write very um, clearly about that journey of... Um, of coming to that conclusion within myself. It wasn't an easy decision that I made, but it was a decision that I felt was right for me. And I have come to the understanding that there is no right or wrong decisions or choices, put it that way, in how people choose to heal. This was the decision that not only felt right for me, but also worked for me. So given that you had two lumpectomies, neither of which with yeah. clear margins. What sort of scans have you had since? Mm, multiple. You know, I do the scans that everybody else does. Um, I had everything done, um, blood and imagery and, um, you know, all the regular scans that people have. What do you understand about your risk of recurrence going forward? I don't anticipate any, and I have no indication that there would be. Zero. What makes you so confident? Because of the life that I live and because of the fact that when I did the work that I did, I looked at the root cause. And, um, and I believe in that the body has the infinite capacity to heal and I can and I am in utter wellness. So I have no indication. Why would I be thinking, oh gosh, what if it comes back? Because then I'd be, you know, fearful and fear is, something that can really make you ill. So I'm not interested in that. And if you're focusing on the, the reoccurrence and instead of focusing on your well-being, and I think that's a, it's a, a wise way to live life is to focus on well-being. Elle says the pinnacle of her well-being has been motherhood. Her two sons, young adults now, Flynn and Sai, are forging their own careers. My mom is a McPherson. She was a uh, supermodel in the 80s. My biggest guidance comes from my own heart, you know, sense of intuition, sense of, a sense of knowing. So that is the guidance. But I do believe the power of love is the most important thing that exists. And my whole life has really been a journey from my head to my head to my heart. And Elle's heart is now with American musician Doyle Bramhall. You're in love again. Is this one a keeper? <laughs> well, I don't think we really keep anybody in the sense that, you know, it is not our role to want to own somebody and uh, it's not a healthy way to, to have a relationship. But I am deeply in love and enjoying every minute of it. Whatever Elle does gets attention, but she's used to it. Besides, she's at peace with her life and her decisions and full of joy for the future. Have you put your demons to rest, Elle? I, I mean, all of the things that plagued you in the early years, have they gone? Are you a different I'm woman these demons days? to rest. I would never have called them demons. They're such, I've had such wonderful opportunities to, um, to evolve, you know, evolve in life. And through the ups and downs, through divorce, through marriage, through cancer, through building businesses, through, um, you know, children, births, it's, it's been extraordinary. And, um, and I'm deeply grateful for it. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on ninenow.com.au and the Nine Now app.